chinwag ready for action. <laughs> battle stations. <laughs> battle, battle stations, stations. ready. <laughs> battle stations. Welcome to the chinwag, everyone. Welcome to the chinwag, Steve. Welcome to the chinwag. You know, great to see you. Fantastic. Likewise, my friend. Fantastic. Hey, uh, given this topic uh, today, have you ever played an astronaut? And uh, and would you like to play an astronaut? Interesting question. I've not played an astronaut. I don't think so. No. Isn't it time? Sure. I think it's time. I think it's absolutely time. I That'd be interesting. I mean, sure. I, I think it's one of those funny things. It's one of those interesting things. So you always see like movies where it's like, you see guys playing cowboys in movies and, you know, and it's always like Gary Cooper and Steve McKay. It's always like, you know, guys who, and you see actual cowboys and you're like, they don't look like, they don't look like <laughs> him. You know what I mean? They're, they don't, and, or you meet actual guys and they're not really like that. A lot of those guys, they're not the Marlboro man guy. It's the same thing with astronauts a little bit. It's like, it's there's true. this assumption of what they're all going to look like. And then they all kind of look like me, some of them. It's like, you know, <laughs> I'm sure they're more fit than I am, but it's like, so I can have to get fit, but I'd love to play an astronaut for sure we had a great episode uh, chinwag goes you got to go way back to get it but we interviewed that wonderful uh, astronaut mike uh, massimino yeah mike yeah massimino. he was yeah. awesome and and he even overcame like uh like his eyesight wasn't as good as it should have been but he was able to overcome it and so there's room for you in space no, no, man. Totally. very very unlikely sort of astronaut no i mean i figure if i play i'm gonna play the guy who gets marooned in space or something right <laughs> i'm gonna play the guy who gets left on the international space station or something right i mean i can't play i have to play a hap a hapless <laughs> astronaut i can't play sort of like the really although maybe i could do something cool maybe you I could, could be, be the scientist like, like the onboard physicist who's combining quantum mechanics and gravity that's going to be you Sh man sure i would love to be that kind of yeah, I would love to. Maybe, maybe it may be fun to play like an Italian astronaut or something, or like a French astronaut. Maybe I play like a guy who's just yeah, the Italian astronaut. That would be good. Something like that. It would be interesting. I would, I would enjoy it. I would definitely enjoy. It. Would you? My question to you is like, given the opportunity to go into space as a, you know, so let's let's imagine that they're they're doing like tourism into space yeah and it is and it, happening and it and yeah. it, yep and it's but Slowly. it's reasonably it's reasonably priced it's right. not some or you happen to have you happen to have some surplus. <laughs> hey, you don't know my what i got in my coffers <laughs> yeah, that's here, right man. that's right let, let me not yeah let me not make any assumptions <laughs> about what you have lying around so maybe you could would you would you go into space would you be comfortable like getting shot up into space uh, i actually think uh Part, I'm of two uh, uh, two minds on this because part of me would be super excited, but I mm. am uh, like, as you know, I'm kind of claustrophobic oh. about the actual space vehicle. That freaks mm -hmm. me out. It reminds me of that friggin' submarine thing. Um, <laughs> so that kind of creeps me out as being stuck yeah. inside a little capsule. And then the fact that like you can just die so easily in space. Um, yeah, kind of. If you would ask me as a younger man, I would have been like, "Yeah, let's go." Yeah, but now, fucking hell, yeah. I'm clinging really? to life, <laughs> but, <laughs> like with everything I got. Or anything, I gotcha. <laughs> but what about the thing like that they sent like Shatner and Bezos up and yeah. that thing that went to the edge of the atmosphere? I guess I would. That looked pretty roomy. That yeah. looked, you know, there were a bunch of people in there that didn't look so like crowded or or claustrophobic, you know. And you could I know still guy, see. I know now I'm like taking your job. I know a guy, uh, but he his job was handling. He's at University of California, San Diego, and his job was handling Stephen Hawking during Hawking's flight into zero oh, gravity. That's right. that's he had right. to be kind of like you know maneuvered and oh, handled yeah. a little bit because of his his situation. And this guy did it, and he said it was amazing. And Hawking who is this guy? Actually, is this guy? Is this guy an astro? Is he a pilot? Is he? A, he's what is a he? uh, engineer, and he he works with the um, he works with the um, Arthur C. Clarke uh, Center for Imaginative Studies down there at University of San Diego. So yeah, fascinating character. Great center. Why didn't I go to the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Imaginative you need Studies? To. I didn't we get a get fucking degree there. from that place, man. Can we go down there? And I mean, we should go down there we sometime. Should. It would be what's, great for Chinwag. What's their deal? Imaginative studies. That yeah. just sounds great. And what do they do? What are they doing down there? They have a bunch of, you know, scientists, philosophers, people from the humanities and the sciences all thinking about and doing experiments on the imagination. And now they're working on like trying to create an atlas of the imagination where they 
they try to see like how are people using their imaginations? How do they think about the imagination? It's really cool what they're oh, up to. Oh, that sounds really cool. That sounds awesome. Oh, yeah, we should definitely go down there. Could I go there and take a class? Probably can. At least some workshops and stuff. Yeah. I think you should go down there and give a lecture. <laughs> okay. No, I'm seriously, yeah, it'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. You use your that imagination really cool. like, you should like go. nobody's You business. have. You have. I have been there. there. Yeah. They're, they're yeah. really wonderful people. They're awesome. San Diego, too, is a nice place. Oh, that sounds awesome. Well, it is all, that's all of this is relevant, space and imagination. It is. But we'll get to that. We'll get, because that's a, a lot of what we touch on in the, this exciting uh, edition of the Chinwag. But before that, we have always want to reach out a hand of thanks and encouragement to our fine and loyal listeners. Yeah, our uh, community is really great. And yeah. keep keep the letters coming. Keep the yep. uh, five-star reviews over yep. uh, at Apple. Um, yeah. That's really helpful. And help us continue to grow the podcast. If you just, you know, just go through the old mental Rolodex and think of the really, like, freakish friends you have, really <laughs> weird, freaky people you know who are interested in the kind of weird stuff that we talk about. And yeah. Uh, and just you know, text text an episode to them or whatever. Just turn them on to it. Turn them on. Uh, turn Give them, them on. The, yes. If you're listening on. to the chin wag, if you're listening, <laughs> then you have some weird friends. So you definitely get, do. Get them signed up. Yes, you definitely <laughs> do. Um, and speaking of a, a an interesting and weird friend, I mean, this yeah. guy is this guy's out there. He's and, awesome. Uh, He's a very busy man, so I'm surprised. I'm amazed, amazed at the time to actually talk to us because the guy does a lot. He He's is constantly very active, in motion. My God, he's a theoretical physicist known for his work in astrophysics and cosmology. He is the Frank B. Baird Jr. Professor of Science at Harvard University and former chair of the Department of Astronomy at Harvard University. He also directs the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center. I used to do that, by the way. I was the guy who did that Were before. Were you the guy before him? <laughs> yeah, I was the guy before him. And I was just, and you know what? I got tired of it. I got tired yeah, of it, Steve. And I you thought, you think, yeah. yeah, you know what? I'm tired of the computation and the theorizing. I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to acting. <laughs> I've had it. I've done. I've done. My work here is done. He is also. He, is, he directs the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and heads the Galileo Project. Also uh, has a home at, at Harvard. He's offered over a thousand research Jesus. articles. Amazing. Amazing. And he's written eight books, including the bestseller extraterrestrial, the first sign of intelligent life beyond Earth. This latest and I have book. to, I want to just interrupt for a moment to tell the listener, like, you may have heard of this guy, but you don't really know what he's like or his views are until you get this chin wag, because it's eye-opening. Yeah. Yeah, it's really yeah. true. He's, he's in a really, no, no, that's really important. And he's a really interesting guy. And uh, Extraterrestrial is a really interesting book. It's more than just a sort of science book addressing the science. There's there's a lot of there's a lot more going on in this book. Yeah. His latest book is titled Interstellar, also great. The Search for Extraterrestrial Life and Our Future in the Stars. Uh there's a lot to cover here. We're thrilled he could take the time to join us on Chinwag, where we will attempt to just scratch the surface of some big, many big topics. I mean, the guy has been involved, aside from all the his extraterrestrial work with sort of possible extraterrestrial intelligence contact and stuff like that. You know, he's a guy who's, he's been studying the, the, yeah. the deepest parts of space, the oldest. Dark matter he worked dark on, matter, black holes. The, the earliest formation stars yeah, that big formed, bang. The, you know, the, yeah, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but we're going to talk to him about as much of this stuff as we can. So please welcome to the Chinwag, Avi Loeb. Hello, Dr. Loeb. He Hello. Good to see you, Paul. <laughs> nice to see you, sir. This is my, uh, my friend, Steve, Stephen Asma. Uh, nice to meet you. Very nice to speak with you. I should tell you before we start or maybe after we start, but... No, go ahead. Go right ahead. We started. As far <laughs> as we're concerned, we've started. Welcome, Dr. Loeb. Welcome. Oh, it's great to be with you. Um, you are absolutely my favorite actor. Uh, really? And I'm not saying that lightly. It's over at least five years that I've uh, seen you on television and ah. um, obviously uh, in various films, and I really like you. 
So oh, thank you. Um, irrespective of what you say, you already have some credit. <laughs> As far as oh, I'm wait till he starts talking. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wait till I start. Wait till I start in. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Are you are you a big like movie watcher and film watcher and yes. TV watcher? Since oh, I too. was a kid, um, uh -huh. uh, I, I watched uh, at least one, uh, some, very often two movies every week, oh. and um, because it opens your mind, uh, and visual uh, effects are far more. Uh, enriching than uh, reading a book, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, oh, that's I'm, interesting. Uh, yeah, it sort of connects to me, my soul as a physicist, with, where I'm dealing with reality. Ah. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to pay attention to to evidence, and of, obviously nowadays that it's qu it's quite rare that people pay attention to evidence, and a lot of people are attracted to put goggles on their head that will show them a virtual reality that is much more flattering to their ego than the actual reality that we all share. And, you know, some people take recreational drugs for mm -hmm. that uh, effect. But um, for me, it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm in love with nature, irrespective of what it is. And every morning I jog at sunrise and I really, you know, I was born on a farm. I'm, I'm, I don't have any account or, or footprint on social media. Uh-huh. Interesting. Uh, in a way, I mean, I, I I live not very far from Henry Thoreau, where Henry Thoreau went. Sure, to, yes, um, that's right. Yeah, Walden, Walden Pond. Pond. Yeah, yes, I mean, exactly. Yeah. And and my small contribution to his thesis is that I extend it to the entire universe. Oh, very nice. <laughs> this is why you're able to produce so many books and articles. Is you're not on social media. You watch yeah. one movie a week. <laughs> no, you have, none of that, yeah. you have none of that interference. It's well, interesting. Um, that yeah, I I should say that I promised my wife when we got married that um, uh, I will not have any, and she she's very wise the, to have suggested that, and uh, I'm happy with that. And you know, nature is so rich uh, yeah. and it's so imaginative that um, I you know I I can fill up my day with uh, thinking about uh, sure. what's up. By the way, it's really important to look up, not just down. That's yeah. another thing. That seems almost more important. But it's That's interesting true. because one of the things in your book, uh, Extraterrestrial, I thought it was very interesting because I'm so used to hearing scientists, astrophysicists, or whatever kind of scientists say they were so inspired by science fiction. And you actually sound like you don't really have a whole lot of tolerance no. for science fiction, which I thought was very surprising. It was interesting, well, but tell, tell me why. Well, because um, I enjoy uh, science and I enjoy fiction, but... Uh, very often the storyline in science fiction stories uh, violates the laws of physics. Uh -huh. I was actually consulted uh, four years ago by Netflix about the three bodies problem that just uh -huh. came out. Sure. Um, yeah, so, but generally speaking, you know, I, I just don't, I cannot enjoy something that I know is wrong. Yeah. When you speak with me, what what you see is what you, you get, so to speak. Uh -huh. And um, so, for example... Yesterday, we went to a restaurant with uh, my wife. We were asked, um, are you going to see the eclipse? Actually, it was a few days ago. Mm. And uh, uh, my wife said, uh, well, you are speaking to an astronomer. She told the, the waitress. And the waitress uh, said, so what do you think about the eclipse? And I said, well, I'm, I'm not particularly excited about it because, <laughs> uh, you know, every night, every night, the earth blocks the sun, right? right? right. So that's an eclipse. So why would I be excited about a different <laughs> rock standing in the way of seeing the sun? You know, like there is nothing more to it than another rock blocking the sun. Like, and, where's um, your poetry, your romance? Yes, yeah. yes, the poetry and the romance. You know, I mean, it's just, just it struck well, me as interesting. I, I, you... I will tell you something about romance because yeah. um, the way I I, I see. Um, you know, dating with extraterrestrials, you know, other civilizations <laughs> that are beyond Earth. In a way, it's, it's a romantic date. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, because just, you know, most people, uh, when they are at home, they they look around, they say, I don't have a partner. Okay. So the advice you give to such people is you should leave your home. You know, you should go to dating sites. You can, right. you should look through the window, and then you will find a partner. And <laughs> uh, you know, even Elon Musk just uh, last week said, uh, "I haven't seen any aliens uh, on Earth, and therefore we might be alone." When I say to him as well, "You, you need to search for them. You can't just imagine <laughs> yeah, that knowledge will fall into your lap." And you know, yeah. that's a mistake 
It's a self-fulfilling prophecy to say, I don't have evidence and therefore we should not look for the evidence. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, the, the reason I'm doing it as a scientist is only over the past decade, we started mm. finding objects from outside the solar system mm. near the Earth, and that changes everything for me. So I see it as a, I'm not trying to imagine how the date would look like. Many people ask me, you know, what would extraterrestrials look like? And I yeah. say, well, uh, what we can imagine is based on our experience here on Earth. And, uh, you know, when you meet with another person uh, for a date, you can pretty mm. much imagine what the person might look like because <laughs> you share the same DNA. But yes. when it comes from a completely different planet, all bets are off. Yeah. So we better not imagine. We better first uh, look around. Paul and I want to ask you all about the anomalous objects that you study specifically here. But one of the things you just mentioned got me thinking, and we read your book, Extraterrestrials. It's an excellent book, highly recommended, Amazing. and Great a new book. one too. Yeah. But one of the things I think is interesting, you mentioned the three-body problem. And one of the things that I think uh, I read in your book was you have to conceive of uh, not just what the alien looks like, which is a su super interesting puzzle, but also what would their uh, minds be like and what would their culture be like? And would they have the same kind of science that we have? And one of the things in Three Body Problem, which is really kind of exciting, is they suggest that, oh, these other aliens, their environment is so cataclysmically unreliable that their science is sort of slower than ours. And I thought that was a really cool idea. And you're talking about that too. So uh, what do you think about, can we assume that another uh, extraterrestrial uh, civilization would have similar science to us, or would it be a radically different kind of science? Well, first, let me explain the, the context here, because just like in uh, human interactions, you know, two body systems are stable. And that's called, in the case of humans, it's called marriages. Uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the case of stars, it's a binary star system where you have two stars held together by gravity. Mm -hmm. When you add a third body, to either cases, you get chaos. And <laughs> yes. uh, that's the, the basis for <laughs> this, like, uh, yes, yes. For this blog. Um, and, um, you know, there are other analogies. Uh, if you take a two-body system, a, a two-star two system, and embed it in a cluster of stars, those uh, binaries, uh, pairs of stars that are very tightly bound, they get tighter. And those mm. that are loosely bound get looser and eventually wow. separate from, which again, uh, if you put, you know, a married couple in a community, <laughs> that, yes. anyway, there are analogies. You should be a, you should be a marriage counselor, doctor. You should, you should, be, you should really think about well, it. Well, uh, not if you ask my wife. Uh, at any event, um, I was lucky. I was just lucky. But uh, at any event, in the context of um, what their intelligence, first of all, I should say that if they arrive to our doorstep before we arrive to their doorstep, they are probably much more advanced than we are because most stars form billions of years before the sun. The sun is a late bloomer and there mm -hmm. are hundreds of billions of stars like the sun, you know, with a planet like the earth, roughly at the same separation. So most likely we are late to the party, okay? Mm. And uh, we can learn from them because just see how our ex exponential technologies are evolving right now, artificial intelligence, yeah. quantum computing. So the point is, if you extrapolate our own development, you know, hundreds of years into the future, it will not be recognizable to us. And mm. to me, a very advanced scientific civilization is a good approximation to God, because mm. if they figure out how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity, uh, they might have quantum gravity engineers that uh, produce a baby universe uh, in the laboratory. Wow. And that's Man. what we defined as God. Uh, you know, so it's interesting uh -huh. about, uh, you know, the, uh, why is religion so appealing to people? Because we are born, you know, into the world uh, as uh, young, uh, as infants, young kids, and we always have parents to take care of us. And we don't fully understand how they do it early on. But then when we grow to become adults, you know, suddenly we see a reality that we don't fully understand, but there is nobody taking care of us. And mm. so having a God, a, a superhuman entity that does it appeals to people. And mm. that was the traditional thinking. Uh, you know, if you go back in time, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, um, it was said that um, 
uh, humans were made in the image of God. Mm. Okay, and uh, obviously children are made by parents in their image, so to speak. So that's where the analogy comes from. And then uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, about mm. uh, 150 years ago, argued that God is dead. Mm. And that was the backdrop for modern science and technology. And that led to people saying, you know, we might be alone. People like mm. Elon Musk, I haven't seen any aliens. Now, <laughs> um, and also Enrico Fermi, 70 years ago, said, where is everybody? <laughs> and yes. then, oh, the you know, I see, I see a right. direct line, a direct line between Nietzsche's statement, God is dead, mm -hmm. and Fermi's paradox, where is everybody? Because if we do the search and find a more intelligent species out there, it will sort of, you know, the kind of things that they might have accomplished would look like miracles to us. You yeah. know, uh, Moses in the in the Bible, the Old Testament, was impressed by a, a bush that was burning without being consumed. And yeah. that led him to believe in God and lead the, the Israelites out of Egypt, uh, out of slavery. And, uh, you know, today you could have impressed uh, Moses very easily by buying a gadget on Amazon that would look like a burning bush. <laughs> and if I if I was next to Moses, you know, I would use the infrared the cameras that we have at the Galileo Project to tell Moses whether indeed this this thing that he's saying uh, was produced by a superhuman entity. So there is this desire uh, for something bigger than us. And I mm. think, you know, first of all, it will come within the next decade in the form of artificial intelligence. We will suddenly mm -hmm. have technological kids that are smarter than us. Mm -hmm. But uh, eventually it will come from another planet. And that will bring a, another benefit. You know, there is this idea in religion that the Messiah will bring peace to earth. Mm. And I don't think the Messiah will come from Brooklyn, like many <laughs> religious <laughs> Orthodox sure. uh, Jews yes, believe it. Yes, uh, yes. I think it will come from another planet and because it will basically change our perspective, our priorities. If you just think about what's going on right now, if you look at the news, you know, we're wasting a lot of resources on conflicts. That's pretty much on zero-sum game. When people focus on territories and then you can only, you know, if one nation conquers territory, another one loses it. Uh, it's a zero-sum game. That's what we are used to. But uh, science is an infinite-sum game where if you gain new knowledge, everyone benefits. So mm. I think, you know, there is no threat, really. It's I mean, Steve, very optimistic. Steve, it's very <laughs> optimistic. It's, I mean, it's Steve, yeah. No, Stephen it's Hawking, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking argued a decade ago that we should be worried of, yeah. uh, because yeah. there might be predators out there. I don't, I'm not worried at all. I'm actually looking forward, you know, just give me a one-way ticket to meet them. <laughs> yeah. And uh, because um, it will change our perspective, you know, and, yeah. and could bring peace to earth and they could teach us things that we don't know. Now you ask me, how do we communicate with them? That's, that's a challenge. But um, actually, you know, I, I think nature is common. You know, that's the, the playground uh -huh. that all of uh -huh. us are playing in as long as you don't put goggles of the metaverse on your head uh, <laughs> or you don't take recreational drugs. I mean, the, the actual reality is the thing that unifies us with any other intelligence. And we can communicate through that. You know, if uh, we should be able to, because I think that math, math and science is universal. Don't you think it's entirely possible that they could be, just to play the sort of devil's advocate or the pessimist, couldn't they be predators? I mean, you look at the state of nature, you have prey, you have predators, you have omnivores. What makes you think they would come all the way from another side of the world for just sort of benign Universe. curiosity? Yeah, they could be like, we need some of your resources, your blood no, or whatever. I, I, actually, <laughs> my view is that they will show up uh, only if we appear to be intelligent enough. I mean, so uh, far, they might look at us and say, it's not worth a not visit. Worth it. It's not worth it. Uh, but uh, presumably, it. too, but presumably too, their impetus would be sort of curiosity. I mean, we can assume that the same way we would be reaching out out of, out of with the impulse of curiosity, we would hope that's why they would be doing it, not necessarily to come and eat all of us. And no, no. I mean, uh, if you I, if, if you go to a restaurant, obviously, when you look at the menu, you find the animals that we regard as less intelligent, like chicken, for example, and we eat them. <laughs> we don't feel any problem eating them. 
So this is my worry that in if we encounter extraterrestrials, we really need to leave a good impression that we are intelligent. Because <laughs> like otherwise they will put us in their soup, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but uh, altogether, I think um, science is better than politics. And, um, you know, what I mean by that is that um, uh, if they are engaged in uh, infinite sum games, in, in uh, acquiring knowledge, and, and they are curious, uh, you know, they would not really care so much about our zero-sum games. They will not care about our resources because they can create a much better reality than you find here on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that will actually, it's just like meeting a smarter student in your class. Uh, you suddenly you realize that you can, uh, you know, do things differently. And that's what I hope will happen. Of course, it's not guaranteed. I mean, this is shock therapy. Uh, we, uh, I mean, Elon Musk and many others prefer to believe that we are the smartest that ever existed. And, you know, Elon himself launched uh, a, a dummy payload uh, that was in the form of his uh, Tesla Roadster car. It's a red car that he launched to space on the Falcon Heavy test uh, <laughs> launch in uh, 2018. And uh, it's now making an elliptic orbit, elliptical orbit around the sun. <laughs> and uh, we can't see it. It doesn't reflect enough sunlight for us to see it, even with the best telescopes. But, um, you know, there might be much more accomplished uh, entrepreneurs since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And we should just check around, you know, maybe every now and then a, a car will collide with Earth. And of course, my, my colleagues would argue, oh, it's just a rock of a type that we've never seen before. Or they would say the data must be wrong, which is pretty much what they said yeah, in relation to some of the things I, yeah, I yeah. studied with. Can you yeah. tell us about the Oumuamua? Oumuamua, like, this object yeah. that, that passed through the solar system, what was it, about five, six years ago? Was It It was uh, October uh, 2017. And it was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii that was constructed as a result of... Uh, 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 the Congress tasking NASA to find all objects bigger than a football field that could collide with Earth. These are called near-Earth objects because we know the dinosaurs were killed by an object the size of Manhattan by, Island. By the way, before we go on, how likely is it we get hit by something that's going to, I mean, is that like, is it fairly likely that that's going to happen again at any point in the future? Well, every year we are uh, hit by a, a rock that is the size of a person. Uh -huh. Okay, oh. And that creates an explosion as a result of the friction of the object with the atmosphere. It creates an explosion that releases uh, as much as the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. Every year you wow. have an atomic explosion in our atmosphere. Is that but right? It's, yeah, but it's at, uh, elevate, at, at an altitude of about 40 kilometers, so uh -huh. we don't okay. feel anything on Earth. Uh, but every now and then you hear about... Uh, you know, it yeah. is something that, yeah, damaged some some forest or so. Mm -hmm. So that happens every year. Now, um, of course, um, these are not uh, uh, particularly worrisome events. Yes. The ones, uh, the bigger the object is, the more energy yes. is released, and it's basically proportional to its mass. So the one that he, uh, killed the dinosaurs and ex you know uh, it, it, it created the uh, nuclear winter on Earth and. Uh, that was uh, the size of about 10, 15 kilometers, the size of Manhattan Island. And um, obviously, nothing like that will happen in the any foreseeable future. In fact, uh, no object bigger than a kilometer, uh, you know, 10 times smaller, is expected, you know, in, in the foreseeable future to hit the Earth. But That's at any event, this telescope in Hawaii <laughs> was, was <laughs> planning to look at much smaller objects by another factor of 10. So 1% mm -hmm. of the size of the object that killed the dinosaurs, because we are smarter. You know, we can perhaps uh, deflect such an object. That's the idea. Um, and uh, so it, it saw an object that was the size of a football field based on the reflection of sunlight and, the, and flagged it as a near-Earth object. And then uh, when the velocity of this object was measured, it, the astronomers realized that actually this object is moving too fast. It cannot be bound to the sun by gravity. And that was the first recognized interstellar object, the size of mm -hmm. a football field. To me, it was a great surprise because a decade earlier, I predicted that no such objects will be found based on what we know about the solar system. 
simply because there aren't enough rocks of that size that we expect <laughs> in interstellar space. Uh -huh. And uh, that's why I was intrigued because when you are wrong, uh, Mother Nature is telling you uh, something new. And that's mm -hmm. an opportunity to learn. Okay, right. so science yeah. is a learning experience. Actually, um, you know, taking risks and being wrong is a way of, um, you know, it makes it worthwhile because otherwise if everything we expect happens, it's really, uh, we've, we've learned nothing, you know? Yeah, there's no progress. So, yeah. So, yeah. so I was intrigued and then the data came in and the object looked really weird because every eight hours it was tumbling and the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10. Mm -hmm. So I immediately contacted Yuri Milner, entrepreneur in uh, Silicon Valley that I was supposed to meet uh, a few days later. And I said, uh, this looks really interesting. Maybe we should use uh, radio telescopes to check if there is any transmission from this object because it doesn't look like a typical rock that we are familiar with. And uh, we checked, but there was no radio transmission, even at the level of a cell phone or a tenth of a cell Amazing. phone. Uh, nothing. Um, okay. But um, then... Uh, so then the more data came in, the more peculiar the object was. And uh, it was realized that it's actually pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force because there was no evaporation, no gas or dust around uh -huh. it. Which would normally be the case with a comet or with or with something. Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. So it was okay. not it was a already comet. passing out, right? It was already going out of our solar system when we yes. discovered. Okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and so... Um, I suggested that maybe it's pushed by reflecting sunlight. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that, the object had to be very thin and sort of a surface layer of a bigger object or maybe something called the light sail, which is built uh, as a thin membrane, just like a sail being pushed by sunlight, which we are now using uh, in space and trying to test in space. So anyway, I suggested that. And of course, the entire community was... Uh, well, at first, my paper was accepted for publication within a few <laughs> days, so people were excited. But then the more traction, the more um, interest there was from the public, uh, the more pushback yeah. I got. And it ended up with people suggesting all kinds of other interpretations, such as, you know, the object definitely is a comet, but the, the tail of the object is invisible to us. Uh, for example, it's made of pure hydrogen, which we've never seen before. Mm. And, but I showed that such an object made of pure hydrogen, an iceberg of a hydrogen, will evaporate actually along the interstellar journey. It wouldn't survive. Mm. So then right. they suggested, well, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg. And there we show that there <laughs> isn't enough solid nitrogen to make enough a big enough population of such objects. So then another suggestion was maybe it's... Uh, a, a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles, <laughs> the a thousand times, straws. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, a hundred times less dense than air, very dilute. So it's pushed by reflecting sunlight. But the problem with that, it would get easily disintegrated when it heats up by hundreds of degrees as it comes close to the sun. So I felt just like the kid in Hans Christian Andersen's uh, tale, where I say the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. Here, em the emperor is Oumuamua. It, it was yeah. given this name because it means a scout in the Hawaiian language. Right. So I, you know, the emperor is Oumuamua and the clothes are the cometary tail. I said, I don't see any cometary tail. It's not me. I mean, it's the telescope doesn't see any. So therefore it's not a comet. No. I, mm. Just like a kid, you know, I say, okay, that's what we know. They say, no, it's a comet. The right. emperor has clothes. You just cannot see them. And they're, and, positing, became, and they're positing these kinds of comets that just simply don't exist, that, that are yes, sort of impossible. That we've never seen before. I was interviewed on, on uh, radio and uh, about uh, a meteor that landed uh, near Kamchatka. Uh, and uh, oh. I, I then uh, checked... One? No, I didn't heard it. This is a different one. So this one landed okay. near, near Russia. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, in December um, uh, 2018. And um, uh, so on January, I was asked about it and I checked online uh, and I found a catalog of meteors that uh, NASA compiled based on data that came from U.S. government satellites. Because over the past decade, the U.S. government uh, established a network of satellites that are monitoring the Earth for uh, the heat 
uh, uh, that is coming from the launch of ballistic missiles. I mean, there's a national security yeah, threat. And, sure. Yeah. Um, and they can detect with infrared sensors. Um, they have cameras on these satellites. They can detect um, within a fraction of a second any launch around the Earth. And every now and then they see an object colliding with Earth and generating a fireball. These are meteors. And they decide, well, this is not... Uh, of any national security interest, we can give it to the scientists. So that's then they deliver the data to NASA and NASA makes a catalog. So then I, I told my student, let's check whether any of these meteors cataloged by NASA is moving too fast to be bound to the sun because I was aware of Oumuamua. We checked and we found one that was definitely not bound. In fact, outside the solar system, it was moving at 60 kilometers per second, a thousand times faster than the speed limit in the highway. And uh, <laughs> it was moving faster than 90%, 95% of all stars near the sun. And moreover, it exploded in the lower atmosphere and had a material strength that was tougher than all other meteors cataloged by NASA, 272 of them. So I said, well, you know, maybe it's a Voyager-like meteor. Uh, if Voyager were to collide with a planet like the Earth after it exits the solar system, it would appear as a meteor of unusual material strength and unusual speed. And so uh, my colleagues, when we submitted the paper for publication, now, you know, said, uh, we don't believe the US government. And so I reached out. I was at the time I chaired the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies, and I complained about the response of some of my colleagues at dinner. And uh, one of the committee members uh, was uh, affiliated with uh, Los Alamos, and he uh, helped me. I, I reached out to the White House, and eventually we got a letter from the U.S. Space Command after three years. The U.S. Space Command issued a letter saying they looked back at the data and they can confirm at the 99.999% that indeed this object, this meteor, came from outside the solar system. Now, this object is um, half a meter in size, released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic so it's bomb. It's very energy. small. It's very. It's, it's small, not very big at all. But, yeah. Right. It's small, but uh, it, it, they gave us the coordinates where the fireball was seen to within uh, uh, about seven miles region. And uh, I decided at that point to lead an expedition to search for the materials. And so I announced that we are planning to do an expedition. Within uh, uh, a few weeks, I got uh, a donor, uh, Charles Hoskinson, who uh, arranged the Zoom meeting with me. I, I never knew him and, uh, and said, you have the money. And so we had the, a, an exceptional team that I was able to to assemble of engineers, navigators, uh, the best in the world, really. And, and we you're went going to the, there, and you're going there to see if you can find any sort of remains or traces of this thing that landed down there. Yeah, That's we went the there actually. We went there. Uh, we had a Netflix uh, crew that uh, came with us because Netflix decided after my book to make a documentary about my research and. So I got used to them uh, and they kept uh, shadowing me on any trip I make. And they went with us and we went uh, for two weeks to the Pacific Ocean, the location of this uh, fireball. And, and what were yeah. you hoping to find and what did you find? Right. So we went uh, on June 14 to 28, um, uh, 2023, last uh, year. And uh, uh, we used the, a sled with magnets on both sides and placed it on the ocean floor, which was uh, about uh, a mile deep. And we dragged it with, uh, back and forth, like mowing the lawn for uh, 26 times across that region. And uh, we collected magnetic particles. We were hoping to get uh, molten uh, droplets from the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that it generated. And indeed, we recovered altogether 850 of them most of them were found by my summer intern, Sophie Bergstrom. Uh, who and they're was, spheres? Are they're, they're tiny, just for tiny, tiny, they're tiny. They're spheres? tiny spheres, right? They're very small yeah. metallic spheres. Uh, less, less than a millimeter in size, uh, uh, the size of a grain of sand. And when you look at them at the, with a microscope, they look beautiful. They look like metallic spheres. And actually, I posted, I, I wrote uh, 43 diary reports and posted them on on Medium, and they were read by millions of people around the world and translated to Spanish. And uh, my daughter, when she saw it, she said, uh, I have two daughters, by the way. Uh, one of them said, uh, 
you know, they look so beautiful. Can you thread one of them uh, on a necklace and give it to me? Nice. And I said, uh, <laughs> good idea, great idea. <laughs> but they're less than a millimeter in size and they're made mostly of mostly of iron. So we can't do that. Uh, we I brought them back in a, in a case uh, to Harvard and gave them uh, to my colleague, uh, Stein Jacobson, who has uh, a laboratory. He's a geochemist and has a, uh, a mass spectrometer and a, an electron uh, microprobe. And uh, we worked on them for eight months and uh, found that 10% of those 850 spherules, about 80 of them, have a chemical composition that was never reported before uh, uh, from uh, solar system materials. And okay. uh, that wow. suggests that indeed uh, we found some material that is from outside the solar system. Now, this is not good enough because it's tiny droplets that melted off a meteor. But yeah. what we want to do is go again and look for bigger pieces. Uh, bigger pieces and and yeah. that will be much more expensive, $7 million. We are now starting the planning and the, the, the importance of bigger pieces. For example, we might recover the core of the object that was not evaporated. Uh, and obviously that will tell us if it's a rock or yeah. a technological gadget, because a gadget, right. as I tell my students, a gadget could have buttons on it. And then the question is, should we press a button? And uh, <laughs> I asked students in my class and uh, yeah. uh, half of them said, Please don't do that. You know, it will it will affect all of us. Yes. And, and and the other half said, "Please do because yeah, that's me. It's... I'd press the button. Yeah, you press the button. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe the it's uh, maybe it's Chat GPT one hundred. You know. Yeah. Like, uh, and so then and and then a student said, uh, Professor Law, what would you actually do given the split vote? And and I said, um, I will don't don't worry. I'll I'll bring it to a laboratory and examine it before engaging with it. Well, doctor, well, that's awesome. a great note to end yeah. on. That's a great Thank note you. to end on. Thank really you good. so much, doctor. That was really amazing. Mind blowing, Steve. Totally mind blowing in the <laughs> best blowing. way possible. In the tradition of the chin wag. He's just one of those guys. He just knows so much. <laughs> it's insane. And he's pretty, he's very humble in his approach to the sciences. Like he's not an arrogant, like I know a bunch of stuff. He's like, let's just do the investigating. Let's do the experiments. Let's look. No, it's that know. thing of kind of just pushing, pushing limits and then, you know, seeing where you can go. It's yeah. really cool. It's a lot Curiosity. of really cool stuff. Yeah. Really cool stuff going on. Yes. That guy could talk for basically and be entertaining for eight hours, I think. And <laughs> he's fascinating. So yeah, Indeed. we have more coming yeah. for you. Yeah. So be sure to check that out. And um, until then, my friend, Steve. Wag on. Chinwag is a production of Treefort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Treefort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Treefort. Audio production supervision by Jared Brom and Matt Dyson. Editing and mixing by Jeff Neal. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Research assistance by Aidan Brooks. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod. <laughs>